or 15 Celsius by dawn on Thursday. A sunny start then for the vast majority on Thursday. And by and large, it's another fine day. Sunny spells, the cloud will build, especially through central areas once again. And it's southern Scotland, northern England, north Wales and the north Midlands, where we'll see some showers start to take place in the afternoon. Showers developing a bit more widely on Friday, especially in the West Isles, and then a change to wetter and windier weather this weekend. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening, you're with GB News. The top story this hour, the final leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, has died at the age of 91, according to Russian media reports. Perhaps most famous for supporting glasnost, or free speech, in his homeland, he also presided over the reunification of Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, as well as the breakup of the communist bloc itself two years later, being widely praised for his pivotal role in ending the Cold War. It's understood he died in hospital in Moscow after a long illness. Boris Johnson says he's saddened to hear the news in a time of Putin's aggression in Ukraine. And Boris Johnson's also been speaking today about the government's efforts to focus on cracking down on violent gangs and putting dangerous offenders behind bars for longer. He made the comments ahead of one of his final visits as Prime Minister as he prepares to join new police officers on the front line tomorrow. The government says more than 13,000 extra police officers have been hired across England and Wales and is all part of Mr Johnson's pledge to put 20,000 additional officers on the streets. An inquest into the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool has told how a police officer tried to save her life by using his hand to cover her gunshot wound as he carried her into hospital. The nine-year-old girl died after being attacked by a gunman who'd chased another man into her home just over a week ago. Despite the efforts of paramedics, they were unable to save her life and a post-mortem examination found the cause of death was a gunshot wound to her chest. The Metropolitan Police has launched a murder inquiry and an appeal asking anyone who might have photography or video footage to help them in their investigation into the murder of a 21-year-old man at the Notting Hill Carnival over the bank holiday weekend. Seven people were stabbed at the event yesterday, including the Bristol rapper Takayo Nempart, who was killed in the Labrook Grove area. 
Metropolitan Police made over 200 arrests at the event, including 33 for possessing an offensive weapon. Pothole repair costs have soared as a result of the war in Ukraine. Around 60% of materials used to repair roads in the UK were sourced from Russia before the invasion. Councils are now saying they have to ration bitumen and find it from other markets, which is pushing up costs and delaying repairs. Latest estimates suggest it could take local authorities across the UK 10 years and £12 billion to bring all road surfaces up to scratch. You're up to date on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News tonight, where it's time now for Headliners. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Welcome to Headliners. Every now and then we are blessed to be in the company of two of the absolute best comedians the UK has to offer. Unfortunately, that's tomorrow night, so tonight we have to make do with Leo Kurse and Kerry Marks. Gentlemen, as ever, I apologise. I <laughs> don't write that. You don't have lines. to read it, so you know, say you don't write it. I should, always, feelings. I should always have something in my back pocket, shouldn't I? There's when still they try too much sincerity in it. <laughs> well, you know, as it is, we've, I've just come back from the Edinburgh Festival and I'd yeah. forgotten that, that they like to trip up the host. I've had a couple of weeks off, but yes. now I am rearmed. Anyway, <laughs> gentlemen, you are very much at the pinnacle of the profession as far as I'm concerned. Let's take a look at the front pages. We start with the Daily Mail. Have police given up on burglary? Devastating... Report reveals detection rates are so low now that the public feel like house break-ins have been effectively decriminalised. Onto the Telegraph, get back to basics, woke police told. Very much the same theme. There is the picture of Mikhail Gorbachev, who has, of course, left us at the age of 91. The Guardian leads with hunger fears as food banks warn stock may run out. The Financial Times has Sunak warns over risk of markets losing faith in the British economy. The PM contender, at least uh, in formal terms, is refusing to admit defeat. And Musk seizes on Twitter whistleblowers' evidence in bid to abandon $44 billion deal. On to the Express, there is a message from Boris. Farewell. I'm proud of the things we did. Has he really gone, though, for good? More on Meghan next from The Sun, Duchess of Delusion. She has drawn equivalence between herself and Nelson Mandela in terms of the hope and jubilation that she offered to the people of Africa, I believe. We'll be coming on to that shortly. And finishing with the star, Diva, moi, shy and humble actress, reveals shock at being labelled a diva by the world's biggest diva. So, those were the front pages. Let's take a look inside. And we lead, of course, with the death of a towering figure, one of the colossi of late 20th century politics, Mikhail Gorbachev. Yes, he sadly died. The former Soviet leader has died aged 92 in hospital in Russia. And, of course, uh, as the last president of the, the Soviet Union, or General Secretary, or whatever they, they called him, uh, he, saw, you know, he, did, he did some great things for Russia. And at the time, we, we never thought that Russia would have turned into the catastrophe it is now. He mm. saw arms reduction deals with the US reducing their nuclear stockpiles, which were actually bankrupting Russia. That's, you know, part, part of the reason, you know, keeping up with the, the Cold War was part of the reason Russia, uh, you know, had to, had to end, um, or the Soviet Union had to end. He forged partnerships with Western powers. Uh, he re refrained from using force when, uh, when you know, the breakaway states wanted to, to form their own countries and pro-democracy protests erupted across the, so the Soviet bloc. Uh, he brought in perestroika, the opening up of, uh, of the economy. Uh, and it's so sad to, to see what's happened. You know, now after, you know, democracy didn't really uh, take hold in, in Russia. There was, a, you know, a sort of false start with, uh, with Boris Yeltsin. And then, obviously, Putin came in and uh, appeared to be a benevolent dictator for a while. But gradually, you know, any sort of autocracy just uh, gradually, you know, calcifies into this, this horrible grip. And now, now Russia is basically just a, a petrol station for China. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's completely weakened. It's sad Interesting. to see. Interesting, yeah. I mean, it, it did feel that was the, the kind of um, the pivot point for the whole of, of the... 
end of history argument, wasn't it? That yeah. analysis, the end of the Cold War, which was Gorbachev's uh, legacy, yeah. did seem to usher in a whole brand new era. And we look back on that now and we think, how could we have been so utterly childishly naive? Mm. Well, of course, and he's, he's remembered now with far more uh, affection by the West mm. than he is in Russia. And, yeah. uh, I mean, this is a quote of his. Russia can succeed only through democracy. Russia is ready for a political competition, a real multi-party system, fair elections and regular rotation of government. What a lovely dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it was never... What it wanted it was transparency, but it turns out transparency in a, in a, a non-democracy, in a dictatorship, really isn't a good thing. Yeah. On the other There's hand, not much Yeltsin, to transpose, Yeltsin who then ran the place for the next ten years, I was just glancing through his Wikipedia page, and apparently when he finally resigned, his approval ratings were at... Two percent. Oh, really? <laughs> really? That's just his mum. Yeah. Like his, his village still. That is virtually <laughs> named individuals, isn't yeah. it? That's his mum, not even too sure. <laughs> but it, I mean, some people have said that Gorbachev. We have a slightly rosy view of even how he was perceived at the time. They, yes. I, I think he did send tanks into Latvia and Lithuania when they tried to break away. But there was, there was. I, I suppose you've always got to compare like with like. Yeah. You? That's yeah, the absolutely. Point. But yeah. it was the time of the end of a Cold War. It, yeah. it was uh, the, the wall coming down, which also he was involved with. It. There was yeah. a lot of massive change. Yeah. And I'm also his promise. style, which maybe I'm just like superficial, but he was he was a gentle and refined and cultivated man. He apparently genuinely formed quite a close bond with Thatcher. Mm -hmm. um, Reagan, I think, found he could do business with him, and there was just a, a general sense there was there was a kind of a dark side to a lot of the uh, party secretaries until that point. A lot of womanising and drinking and so on. He was well, yeah, he was a family man also, who would also go home every evening. Yeah. Also torture and stuff. Oh yeah, I mean if you go far <laughs> back far enough, but also you know even as you moved into the modern era they were still kind of running it like gangsters. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Know. And I, th I think what, what this has shown, what, what the sort of Soviet Union's collapse, uh, we, we thought, in the West, we think democracy is going to flourish. Anytime yeah. you topple a dictator or a communist regime, democracy will just naturally spring up. And actually, democracy is really difficult. We couldn't, we couldn't get it going in Afghanistan, Iraq, no. couldn't get it going in, in the Soviet Union. So... Culture. Culture runs very deep. It's yeah. a mysterious thing. Wednesday's Telegraph and our Eurostar taking the mickey out of Brexit with this one. Eurostar scraps trains, which doesn't mean uh, we'll be able to buy a cheap one soon. Uh, <laughs> and the train's going from London to Disneyland. Uh, the operator, uh, they've stopped at the direct trains going. So you can still go there. Mm. You can still go there, but just as um, everything is changing and nothing for the better right now, <laughs> uh, it's just more like look in any direction, you'll find some depressing news. So for holiday makers, uh, it doesn't bother me much. I've never been to Disneyland. I've been to I'm Disneyland, saying that Paris, to start a campaign. and I would say it was it was the worst of both. It was the worst of Disney and the worst <laughs> really? of Paris combined yeah. into one middle, and it poured with rain as well, which is <laughs> which I don't blame Paris for, of course. But you've got to understand, Disney World and Disney Land in Florida and California, never remember which way around they are. They are sustained by eternal sunshine as yeah. much as yes. anything else. I mean, that really is crucial. Those kind of environments really feel dismal in yeah. the rain, right. you know. Dismal land. Dismal land, so we yeah. Did, we yeah. did one in Tunisia or somewhere like that. But, I mean, this, <laughs> this story just, just shows uh, how the government gets in the way of everybody being able yeah. to function. I mean, we, we've seen the, the doing away of uh, the Soviet Union, but now, you know, the European Union and even, even our government quite often act in, you know, such an autocratic, officious way. So there used to be 25 Eurostar services going each day to, right. uh, to Paris and uh, prior to the pandemic. And uh, now the French border and security officials say they can only deal with 13. They obviously can deal with more, yeah. but they're just saying that because they're not nice. It's an extraordinarily bad-tempered exchange. On to Wednesday's Times. Hello, hello, hello. What do we have here then, Leo? Yes, yeah, so Police Scotland. Well, this would be OK, the new, OK, the new, OK, the new, rather than... <laughs> <laughs> So Police Scotland have <laughs> no been... No wonder that never caught on. <laughs> <laughs> They've been criticised... Uh, well, I don't think they even say hello now. They just <laughs> kicked down the door and asked to see your Twitter account. <laughs> but uh, Police Scotland have been criticised for transparency rules that equate journalists with criminals <laughs> and compel officers to declare any relationship they have with reporters. It's yeah. insanity. And this comes after... Uh, this scrutiny comes after um, the College of Policing. Uh, there's a backlash to its suggestion that fraternising... Uh, police fraternising with journalists could lead to corruption or operational compromise. Turns out this has been the case in Scotland since 2017. So we've had five years. Nobody looked at it because nobody cares about Scotland. We've had, we've had five years of uh, the police treating of this journalists. Advice. 
Yeah, this advice... To, to be police... fair, the class of, of, uh, of individuals with whom the police have to declare there any relationship is not just journalists and criminals, is it? There's, there's about a half a dozen, and I think, I think criminals are actually the outlier, in a I, sense. I think it's the concern that they've added... Or actually, journalists yeah. have been added to the list for some time now. It's right. only uh, with, with the latest transparency we now know about it. Yeah, yeah. And Police Scotland have said, we police get up to all kinds of bad stuff. We'd rather not get found out. <laughs> uh, that's not exactly what they said. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Journalists said but... the same thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but they yeah. do all have it. I mean, even the local papers have a tame copper, though, don't they? It's the only way to get the stories and to get the sure. Well, yeah, but, but the thing is, it's essential for the you know properly functioning fourth estate, and you yeah. know, it's so weakened at the moment. You know, with circulations of newspapers yeah. dropping. I mean, uh, thank thank God we're buying them in this show. To broadcast for the next day, like the circulations are dropping, so there's not enough money. Journalists aren't getting getting paid. It's not the sort of viable career that you know people used to used to go and study, and it used to have great prestige. Yep. So you know, I think the the quality of investigative reporting is, is sort of diminished and being replaced with clickbaity. Yes. But I suppose there articles. is. I mean, what would I don't I don't know exactly what we're talking about, but my sense would be that it is. Do you have a, a journalist with whom you have a special relationship rather than one that you're just willing to talk to through the open, you know, the normal open channels? Is there is there one that you're regularly having, you know, Jack Regan but it's style, be, that's, you know, after right. hours uh, whiskies in the... Well, that's in not the way law works, though, is it? No. It's, it's <laughs> like once you've done a thing, yeah. if you've given away sensitive information and then yeah, you get yeah. in trouble for it, that's the crime. Yeah. It's not knowing someone where you could do that. That's, that's <laughs> well, the most, potential. I mean, most of the, uh, most of the decent, gritty police dramas I grew up on, were, it was based on the idea that not only did coppers have a relationship with journalists, they also had a relationship with criminals. They yes, had quite yeah, a few yes. criminals that they knew that they would go around and say, what do you know about this, you yeah, know, and they used to arrest some criminals as well. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Leo. Uh, more police stuff now. This one's mm, uh, Wednesday's Mail, the front page, I think, Leo. In fact, yeah. yeah so this is continuing on with uh, with the police uh, police thing. So British policing has lost its way, and officers should stop uh, doing woke actions such as taking the knee mm. and wearing partisan political badges or symbols uh, by a public which has lost confidence in, in the police across the country, according to hard-hitting report by yeah. Policy Exchange, which is a, a think tank. So this, and they also suggest abolishing the College of Policing, which isn't a, it's not the police uh, training college. It's, it's a very cleverly advice. named sort of propaganda yes. outlet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they give all, they give all the, the advice that we're just talking about, about, yeah. you know, treating journalists as criminals. Uh, but they've also come up with ridiculous stuff like uh, non-crime hate incidents. So, you know, if, if somebody commits something that's been reported as a hate crime, yeah. and there's no actual crime, still record it and make sure their, their life is destroyed through DBS checks. Yeah. But it's not an actual crime. Also, you know, arresting people for tweets and stuff like that. Well, did like you that. see the... Um, Andrew Doyle covered this, I think, on Free Speech Nation last Sunday, where there was uh, an LGBT Pride uh, event yeah. and, and uh, a, a, a group of lesbians who do not like to be bracketed alongside trans people yeah. were campaigning within that Pride event that, you know, that this is... this this the, All these letters do not belong together and one of these is not like the others. And there were police officers there arresting them and moving them on who were wearing the insignia of the official LGBT... Do you know what I mean? They so had, the trans, they right, had okay. de the obviously lobby. demonstrated, like, on the side of their vehicles... Yeah. The, their... they, they picked a side yeah. that debate. That is not good. That's no, not absolutely. Healthy, Police you know. should, should... They're there to, to yeah. enact the Break law. Break up fights, it, not join in on one side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. A th there's a thin United line. United there's, said... <laughs> there's a complaint here about the Lincolnshire Police coming under fire for dancing at a Pride event, which I think that kind of thing's fine, isn't it? It's nice to see police having fun. It's the but thin end of the long arm uh, of the yeah. wedge, but, yeah, I know what but you mean. But don't get yeah. involved in areas that, that shouldn't be But then be last time you see, there was a thing... Not actually doing enough policing. There was a... Footage of a few years ago of a, a female police officer. I think we might be coming on to the Notting Hill event recently, but she was kind of dancing, and then it sort of, and then the with a a, 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 a festival goer who then became clearly too suggestive. It was inappropriate, you know, <laughs> essentially. And then you think, well, okay, I suppose it's fine, but it's not fine because then you read police officer sexually assaulted. You know, mm. a number of police officers assaulted, and that kind of thing right. diminishes the. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's very difficult. Can you can dance, see why though, right? the Dancing why the right. line was drawn quite high yeah. before. You know why they were standoff. Are you saying they shouldn't ever be allowed to dance? Well, I'm saying dance. twerking is in not. Oh, yeah, a little, a little dance, taxes. a little shake about, and a, a pride march or something. 
meter's yeah, running, if the meter's running, what, what, have you got, yes. what have you got a taxi home tonight and the taxi yeah. driver stops to get out and have a dance? It's like, no, drive the taxi. Police <laughs> arrest the criminals. If he dances whilst driving, yeah. he's still efficient. <laughs> I'm quite fine with that, And then comes around the back with a little bag with some champagne and some good news. Yeah, we know how that goes. <laughs> Wednesday's sun and backlash for the world's most talked-about woman, Kerry. This has gone badly wrong for Meghan. Uh, yes, this is Nelson Mandela's uh, grandson who has slammed uh, the Meghan Remarkable for comparing herself to <laughs> South African freedom fighter, which is just incredible. Almost everything this woman says is like a car crash in Paris <laughs> waiting <laughs> to happen. Um, uh, you know, Mandela, 25, 26 years in prison, he ended 60, 60 years of apartheid, and she compares the celebrate. But even the, the even if that had been said by, by a cast member in a, in a London show, yeah. you don't repeat it. No, repeating, it was, Repeating it? praise like that is was so disgusting. Was it a cast member? Is that where she... Cos somebody said that. Uh, it's so, a cast... It? I'll tell you what it was. Repeating it's, uh, praise like that is like what a comedian would do at the Edinburgh Fringe. It, cos, yes. yes, and, it, and it's yeah. not, I got five stars, it's yeah. someone said they like me. Yes. It's like, it's like if someone told me said, my, my appearance on GB Brand. News was, was, was like a, a, a Martin Luther King speech. <laughs> you know, I would say, that's very nice, you and walk away going, he's a bit mad. I wouldn't yeah. be going around <laughs> tweeting it or telling everyone, guess how much I'm loved. It's, it's for others to say. That's the way to say it. Am I like Jesus? That's for others to say. Yeah. I, th I think well, she... what she said was, as well, that she didn't exactly say that he had said that she was like Mandela, although the implication... It was like the level of joy... Yes. ..that, yeah. that the royal wedding had brought. It's worse, it's worse than saying she's exactly. like Mandela. Exactly. Like, she says, uh, when you married into this family, she re repeats somebody telling her, when you married into this family, we, we rejoice in the streets the same way we did when Mandela was free yeah. from prison. That's hilarious. That's nonsense. Well, maybe they rejoiced the same way. There was some dance, <laughs> but, you know... That's I think she's different. the perfect princess for these self-indulgent times. Yeah, yeah. You know, she kind of represents it well. It's Can I tell really you some is. of the things she, she said in her interview? She said that... Uh, uh, she talks about when... Um, uh, when, when they bought the mansion, the, there were two palm trees, and Harry said, my love, it is us. Uh, which is just <laughs> well, very the sweet. Two palm trees are clearly there's like clearly them. an inappropriate hierarchy. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And then Archie goes past and says, "Hi, Mama. Hi, Papa." Which it sounds like he was talking to the trees because he can't tell the difference between <laughs> trees and his own parents. <laughs> like uh, what a Prince thick Charles, kid. Then. Well, Prince Charles to, uh, talks, to, to talks to trees and probably hugs yeah. them as well. Which, by but the way, get, suggest... get consent. That trees suggest... haven't agreed to the weird tree huggers. <laughs> that would suggest a genetic link. Wouldn't yeah. it between Prince Charles and Harry? Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Wednesday's Guardian and Liz Truss wants more drilling. Liam. Oh, finally, some good news. So uh, Liz, <laughs> Liz Truss is going to sign off on more drilling uh, contracts if she uh, become if she wins the Conservative leadership election, which is due to end sometime in 2025. Right. Apparently, it's been going on for about a year. Yeah. It's like just pick one. It's like, come on, no. <laughs> I Nobody think, cares. to be fair, they have picked one, they, haven't picked they? One. Yeah. Just do it. Just yeah. sign, rubber stamp it. Like, we, we need a Prime Minister. Boris hasn't even turned up to his own victory parade, so, like, <laughs> yeah, just, just do it. But, uh, yeah, so Liz Truss is going to issue up to 130 new drilling licences. Unfortunately, they, they typically take around an average of 28 years, apparently, to result in any oil uh, coming out. So, you know, it might be a bit late to save Ukraine this winter. And also it'll be sold <laughs> at global market prices, so it's yeah. not like it would, yes. you know, massively uh, bring energy prices down. But it, at least it's something, and, you know, we should, be, we should be doing it. We should have been doing this 28 years ago, signing off on these licences. Uh, and Greenpeace have criticised so Dr Doug Parr, who's some scientist for Greenpeace, has criticised it. And he then, he then says, this is the bit that, that is insane, he says if, uh, the, if Liz Truss really wants to, to help households, she should bring in an energy bill freeze and extra financial support. So he wants the government, Greenpeace want the government to support, to financially subsidise people to use more fossil fuels. Yeah. That yes, is not to find That is the opposite fuels. of what Greenpeace... I thought Greenpeace wanted people to use less fossil fuels. So then the price is going up. Are doing what Greenpeace want because it'll result in people using the less. It's, it's and anyway, bad. the government... I mean, I hate to sound like my father on this, but it's a fact. The government don't have any money. If you say the government have to pay everyone's fuel bill, yeah. I mean, where, where do they then think the government will get that money from? Right. It's not like they, they have... Like, there's a, they're a lender of last resort, is it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like... It's not helpful at all, in yeah. reality. It's still an but neither it's is Liz Truss's plan. No, none of these plans are, are helpful. They should... Yeah. They, you know, it's all a, a, an absolute yeah. well, a cluster bomb. A lot it? of people are saying that they're not going to pay their energy bills, and that's great, because it means they'll get cut off, which means we won't need to introduce energy rationing. And then, you know, people who don't pay bills... <laughs> You're against energy rationing. 
What are your plans for the cold winter? <laughs> well, I don't know, because we're being told to uh, insulate homes more and at the same time make homes more efficient for heat waves. <laughs> these, these, yes. these are contradictions, aren't they? So we're not... We're, and the trouble with no, Britain is we're not, we're not really also, good. The insulation keeps the heat out as well, usually. Does it? Yeah, yeah, that's how insulation works. Like a thermos were, keeps yeah. things hot or okay. cold, depending on... The key is to go to the pub more often, because pubs are going to struggle through the winter to pay their heating bills. Yes, totally. Turn all the heating off at home and take the whole family down to the pub. By one half of... Well, dollars. pubs yeah, are... Yeah. They're <laughs> reckoning a lot of pubs are going to close. They can't afford their heating bills. Well, we're going to have to come up with that. Maybe well another story, but, yeah, I think we will want to do our bit to things move Things are even harder around. for Meghan Markle. <laughs> Wednesday's Times now, our last one before the break. Uh, the UN have waded into these Pakistan floods. Kerry. Um, OK, pa this is from the Times. Pakistan is not to blame for the climate crisis fueled flooding, says uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, which um, obviously is, is not to blame for flooding. There's, uh, no. But it's, it's, it, we're seeing disastrous scenes. I'll read you of the 33 million people displaced, one in seven affected, 72 districts in calamity, 3,500 kilometres of road flooded, one million animals are dead. Sure. Uh, and, and this is extreme on scenes. Um, I mean, th th she's quite correct to say that, uh, that, that pa Pakistan is responsible for 1% of the, uh, the global change we're seeing yeah. and are suffering a, a far higher percentage of the damage, uh, which happens. You know, in, in a, if a life, lifeboat is, boat is sinking and water's getting in, the family on the side where all the fat people are are going to get wettest and fastest, but everything's going down. I can't so be I, sure. I, 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 I mean, I don't want to be sceptical about it. It might be global warming. I do remember huge floods killing millions in, or at least uh, up, uprooting millions in Bangladesh in 1971 or something, I think, George... Uh, it happened. Yeah, but no, we're seeing, a... we're but seeing no, burning everything. and flooding around the world right now and, mm. uh, you know, heating. It's, it's, it's way too much. Yeah. Now everything is because of climate change. Mm. So it, it's become the new Brexit. I remember when uh, bad things happened and it was Brexit's fault and mm. now it's climate change's fault. This at least cannot be pinned on Brexit, I think it's fair to say. But it is... I mean, it's very distressing. It's obviously on a vast scale. And uh, I think world relief is probably in order, wouldn't you say? Even well, if it wasn't climate totally, change. It's one of those things where you just think if you're in a community of nations, there should be a... He's made a call for uh, $10 billion. Uh, and he's added, you know, just in case we think that... You know, because sometimes um, leaders in uh, nations, nations like this yeah. aren't... You know, they do kind of siphon off a bit of the cash yeah. or a lot of the cash. Uh, but he said there would be transparency on all funds that are donated. Well, let's hope something comes to their aid soon. That is it for this part of the show. Coming up after the break, Leo will be deciding the fate of the Notting Hill Carnival, Kerry will be espousing the virtues of the Saudi Arabian justice system, and I will be offering my views on the most pressing issue of the day, namely Love Island. We'll see you in a couple of moments. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back to Headliners with me, your friend Simon Evans, my friend Leo Kirsten, his friend Kerry Marks. That's how we do it. It's a chain. So, <laughs> let's get to it. We kick off part two with Wednesday's Telegraph and the Police Federation being party poopers, it seems, this time. Yeah. Well, police in London have called for the future of the Notting Hill Carnival to be reviewed after the first event since 2019 was marred by violence, with one person murdered, stabbed in the groin, uh, six others stabbed, and dozens of officers uh, assaulted. And more than uh, 200 people were arrested at the event, which I, I would still probably describe as mostly peaceful. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're saying... I mean, the, the police uh, deal with it. <laughs> apparently, apparently, it's incredibly um, traumatic for a lot of the, lot yeah. of the police. They get, yeah. they get assaulted. Uh, they have 11,000 officers on duty, so that's a lot of money. I, did, I didn't realise it was so many, so many officers. And uh, 34 of them have been hurt. Uh, a female officer was grabbed in a headlock and sexually assaulted. Uh, so, yeah, the, the police want, want an end to it because they don't want to do any work. No, well, no, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky <laughs> one. It's, I mean, it's very difficult because the scale of the thing is vast and obviously it's quite it's got an entrenched history. So it's not just something you can go, oh, get get rid of it. This is this is you know. No, it's a tradition. Yeah, We've heard a lot of new officers who were shocked by how, how much violence they had yeah, to deal with. But yeah. I, I grew up with bomb movies and action movies where, where the criminal always heads to the carnival. That's, yeah. where, the, yeah. that's where the stuff's supposed that's to happen. Where that's where the chaos is. to hide between yeah. them. There's also... There, there was a video of a man punching a woman, which was kind of horrifying, which yeah. was all over the internet today. Yeah. And it amazed me that in a time where you can wear a face mask... And, and, and you're at a carnival, which is an ideal time to wear a mask, why the hell aren't you? Yeah. It's the, I, the, if you're going to be violent... Uh, you've got the one chance to cover it up. And <laughs> some years ago in America, there was the carnival murderer got caught. And, and right. I remember loads of stuff at the time about the, the neighbours saying he seemed like such an ordinary person. Like they, they hadn't even noticed his big paper mache head. He <laughs> walked past with every day. He went everyone on a, on a float. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The clues were there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. If football fans did this. If every every year football fans decided to to meet up in Notting Hill and go on a big uh, parade, you know that yeah. and caused all this this aggro, they'd probably get shot. Down. But then again, there is, uh, you know, there is the history of it, um, which justifies it, apparently. Well, I don't know. How many people is it there that actually visit over the course of the long weekend? Do you have any ideas? I, I, was over a million, I don't know. I can tell you how many people million. were murdered, I think stabbed so. Over the course of the whole uh, weekend. How many do you think? I think somebody said over a million. Come, come wow. Make, over the, like, the four days. Have you ever been? Title. Yeah, years ago when I was a student. Yeah, I didn't Back really when you enjoy were cool. it. Warm red stripe <laughs> is that, is that like in a the, bucket, you know. Is that the first one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was all in black and white then. <laughs> On to Wednesday's Guardian, and it seems Saudi Arabia are not the bastions of free speech and democracy and expression, we thought. Oh, my God, really? <laughs> yeah. uh, Saudi woman uh, jailed for 45 years over social media use. Uh, this is Nora bint Sayed al Qatani, who was accused of using the internet to tear Saudi Arabia's social fabric. As far as I understand, she didn't actually use the internet very much. She, she, she went on Twitter and she liked a few things and even retweeted a couple of things, and that's got her... 45 years in prison for um, tearing uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's social fabric. You think if they'd understood the outside point of view, they'd realise that what tears the social fabric is, is this. Yeah. Is doing this. The same as, you know, it's like if someone says that you overreact and then you shoot them. <laughs> You know, you're kind of not proving them wrong. So you're saying this is this is this is um, bringing Saudi Arabia's name into disrepute internationally, but maybe like locally they mean. I don't know what the nature. Well, of the they mean was, locally. Though. It's definitely uh, entrenching sort of order in, yeah. in the kingdom, like they do with uh, like any autocratic regime. It's, it's an is Islamist theocracy. Uh, but yeah, 45 years for for liking some tweets in, in Britain, you'd only get. 10 she didn't years. even write. Them. She just <laughs> liked them. Did she not like them? Uh, no, no, she liked okay, like a few yeah. tweets, but it works for the joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. I'll, do, I'll do it again in case you didn't hear it. A bit of, of humour licence, really. Britain, you'd but... only get ten years. I only get ten years. <laughs> but I do want to know what she wrote, and it's impossible to find out. Is it... I don't think she wrote anything. I, I think she only retweeted a few things. Wow. So it's not even for something... She, I, I did say... I, I had a glance through the story before, and I think I'm correct in saying that. There was yeah. another case of a 34-year-old uh, PhD student at Leeds University, mother of two, who was convicted and sentenced for 34 years after she returned to Saudi for a holiday break. I don't think that's the reason why she got uh, arrested. But, um... Well... No, that's, uh... It's certainly pretty I think the, the Arab Spring turned, into a, turned out to be a bit of a hop. 
Yeah, well, it's interesting. Really. The Arab Spring, you know, people, the young people used the internet to sort of organise their protest, yeah. but now yeah. the governments have flipped it and now they've sort of mastered the internet and they're using it to enforce their rules. Yeah, I don't think it reached Saudi Arabia even th at the time, but let's go to Wednesday's Metro now. Who better to discuss this one? One of Love Island's biggest fans. <laughs> Love Island, uh, yeah, it's a great island. It's much better than, uh, than testicular pain <laughs> island. Uh, it will not face a further probe into the bullying and misogynistic behaviour uh, after receiving thousands of complaints, according to, to Ofcom. Uh, so broad, the broadcast watchdog Ofcom revealed that they received uh, 7,500 complaints about the popular ITV dating show, uh, with viewers saying it featured alleged misogyny, emotional abuse and coercive control. I mean, I couldn't, they, they don't actually say... Uh, they don't specify what the what the abuse was. I tried finding it on the internet. It seems to be you know people looking at people funny or. Uh, I found one example. There was there was a woman on there who was in a, a, an episode of Snog Marry or Pie, which is like right. you get a pie in the face. And when she was pied, she she, she was uh, they they asked the other contestants why have you been why have you pied her? They gave their reasons. I don't know what they were. And then later she was seen crying alone by the pool. That's she, awful. Yeah. So it's kind of baked cry. into the rules, isn't we it? That's the whole the point. Is it's pie. like yeah, baked into the. Pie. I mean, is, isn't pieing cultural appropriation from clowns anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's a snug Marion? What's, what's, what's how do, you wear, do people wear clown face? Yeah. <laughs> Just you can't exactly. Do clown face. <laughs> but yeah, like in previous years, Love Island, I mean, we shouldn't forget the, the wonderful work it's done in uh, <laughs> getting Instagram influencers to commit suicide. <laughs> uh, I guess that's why they're a little bit twitchy about it. On to Wednesday's think, yeah. Telegraph and a pretty shocking statistic, Kerry, now. Um, well, this, uh, every time I'm on the show, it has a kind of theme running, and tonight it's uh, bullying, stabbing, murdering, assault, and uh, one in three women at music festivals sexually assaulted or harassed. Uh, and this is based on a new study done at uh, Durham University. 34% of women had been sexually harassed uh, or assaulted at festivals. Um, they're calling them drive-bys, which... Uh, but, you know, there's something similar with a drive... I saw a drive-by, really. Well, you know, drive-by being one of these ones where uh, a car pulls up and a couple of men start yelling at a woman at the side of the road. And, and it's horrible. To, to, I, I wonder... Surely it's never worked. I, I wonder what even gets in someone's head they're going to pull over and start shouting abuse at a woman. No woman ever gets into that, the car and goes, you're just what I'm looking for. That's actually how so, I met my uh, wife. Is it? Well, yeah. not She pulled wife, over but... in the car, started... Does she know you? Well, you got under that kilt. Does she know she's your wife? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, the um, the festival thing. You you have to sort of separate a little bit of. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to sound like sleazy myself, but there are gradations, aren't there? There's a certain amount of argy bargy in a lot in eighty thousand people at the pyramid. Well, let's call well, this up and get Simon cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I the, know... I'm sure this goes on a lot, but the, but the, 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 I don't know how you police him, and people are always mm. saying that the men need to have a conversation with each other, but this, this proves that that won't work because yeah. there's a reason why they're going to busy places. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason why they're going but into places where they're not going to be noticed and can move away fast into a crowd and get away with I it. I think there is something in a lot of male culture uh, that is quite misogynistic and sort of uh, opportunistic uh, with yeah. regard to, to women, and especially if you get groups of men. So, like, like it says here, there's, there's groups of men. Mm. Men always sort of get magnified. Their, their bad traits get magnified in groups. Mm. And, you know, they're drinking and also women are drinking and, you know... Well, exactly what you said about the, the van thing. I'm sure you do realise it, obviously, but I bet that doesn't happen very often when, when a bloke is in a van on his own. He's obviously yeah. not trying to attract the woman. He's trying to show off to, to his, his mate friend. that he has the courage to yeah. insult a woman. The trouble, you know, with the, the, the trouble with a lot of this is it's very hard to come up with an answer for it that's not victim-blaming. Like, yeah. One of the problems here they're talking about is men putting their hands up women's skirts. So, you know, if you had women's skirts with uh, mouse traps in them, which I'd love to see that, and people just... <laughs> <laughs> but even suggesting it, you know that someone's well, going to come back and go, well, it's the victim's fault, isn't it? But no, yeah. or maybe police decoys in crowds. You could insert a you know, Chinese it's... finger trap, like a... <laughs> 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 Not sure that would be <laughs> quite the disincentive. Up it's next good idea. is Wednesday's Mail. Uh, this is a tragic one, Neil. Oh, yeah, so this, this one's horrible. Uh, so a vegan mother... Uh, she's 39. She's ja been jailed for life for killing her 18-month-old son after he died weighing just 17 pounds after following a strict diet 
of only raw fruit and vegetables. So he's 18 months old, but he, 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 he was the size of a seven-month-old baby when he, wow. when he died in September 2019. So he was just fed, you know, raw vegetables. She's got other children as well who are also malnourished. There's one child who, who was OK because he uh, went and stayed with, with the father. Uh, but apparently it was the quickest investigation ever. She couldn't wait to tell the officers about uh, her vegan diet. Yeah. So I tried to make a joke about it. No, I get it. Is it was it in the UK, this? No, it's um, in Florida. It's in Florida, oh, Florida yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's yeah. horrifying, but, yeah. uh, I mean, some people jump on it and say, therefore, being a... I'm, I'm not a vegan, but at the same time, I do think there's a point in the future where people are going to look back on meat eaters when the vegan diet is perfect, when, when, when it's that good. Yeah. Um, my ex-wife is a vegan. She's very healthy. There's a lot, lot of athletes who are vegan, so it can be done. And you can not, misread this story in the sense that you could take Joseph Fritzl's story and say, therefore, it's wrong to bring a child up in a basement, which yeah. it isn't. When you're saying she's your, your ex-wife, that yes. she's still alive and well and healthy. She's still very she's, healthy, She's just yes. not I mean, married to you anymore. Yeah, yeah, take okay. it alive, no. Yeah. No, I think it is ridiculous to say that... I mean, I'm sure you can raise a child on, on a vegan diet, that, but I think it... You not have a to baby, give, though. You have to give them a but certain amount of fat, don't you? That's this the is trouble. about the so amount of nutrition, not food. We've seen There are sources of fat in nature. No, we've seen this before with people... Uh, trying to raise, raise babies. And I just yeah. see it as the same as, you know, some extremist religious uh, thing, like, you know, yeah. denying a, a child medical treatment or something. But the, chi the child hasn't made the decision. A baby hasn't made a decision to be vegan. Fair yeah. enough, if you want to be vegan, if you want to eat disgusting food and fart all day, you do it. But don't impose that on a, on a baby. We, we see lots of unhappy pets as well, don't we? Yeah. Raised by vegan vegans. Cats. We decided, yes, yeah. that my yeah. cat is a vegan. Yeah, and it's transgender. That is and the end. Transgender, yeah. <laughs> that is the end of part <laughs> Don't be sad. After the break, we've got BBC Radio 2 Exodus, the best way to stop prostate cancer. You are going to enjoy that one. And Phantom Speed Camera. See you shortly. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. <laughs> my name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back to Headliners with me, Simon Evans, Leo Kirst and Kerry Marks. So, this one is from Wednesday's Telegraph and it's the BBC talent strategy has been misplaced, Kerry. Um, yeah, the Radio 2 drive to attract younger listeners will see a talent exodus worse. And this is according to the head of, the, head of uh, BBC Music Entertainment, hmm. um, Trevor Dan. Uh, so, so what it is, the Radio 2's audience is getting older, and now an average 54, uh, but they're, they're focusing more on what they call here 35 to 44 C2DE women. I'm not sure what that is. That's breast size, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, That's a droid um, in Star Wars. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they've, <laughs> they've lost um, a, a number of older presenters recently uh, on the list. Um, Steve Wright, Tony Blackburn, Craig Charles, um, 
I mean, Tony uh, Blackburn, to be fair, others. is 79. Right? Yeah. I think at that point, you can't really kind of write that off as ageism, can you? There's got to be a point. <laughs> well, there's going to be change. You know, I, I think it's also that we're in an age where we talk about representation a lot. You know, but back yeah. in my day, I guess, um, I was always... I grew up used to seeing presenters who were older than me and spoke in RP accents, and yeah. uh, it was kind of fairer cos no-one was represented. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and now be. everyone was fair. <laughs> and then it became accents, and then it became more regional accents, and now uh, the exact age and everything, so... But there uh, was lovely... I remember several Radio 2 programmes not that long ago that were presented, you almost felt, from an old man's study, and yeah. you almost heard him sort of lowering the needle on... Yeah, that's on, nice. On it was like, nice, yeah. yeah like, even, yeah. even John Peel's show, which wasn't... Yeah. I don't think it was Radio 2, it was Radio one, but it, was, it had the same sort of same sort of vibe. I there mean, is a kind of automated. Then we found out it did terrible things, but yes. at the time, <laughs> at the time, it was great. But I think the BBC are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because uh, they've got to justify the license fee, so the you know young people just don't don't listen to, don't watch BBC, don't yeah. listen to it. They're all on TikTok, uh, getting corrupted by the Chinese government. But you know they've <laughs> got to, you know what's why should they pay, pay the license fee if they, if they don't use it? And on the other hand, uh, by trying to appeal to those people, they're alienating the people who actually do use the service. Yeah, so. and I would have thought 35 to 70 is a pretty big chunk of the population. That should be, a f you know, in which 55 is bang in the middle, is my yeah. point, you know. So that's not a catastrophe, is it? But I've always thought it's nice to have older presenters on things because then that means everyone leads up to that, you know, yeah, because yeah. everyone does get older, so therefore everyone gets a chance. And when you start taking from lower down, then a lot of people do, or, or there's a lot of talent that misses out. Yeah. But I, I can still fully understand why they would want to try and bring in the younger audience and get them off Twitter. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, well, I'm glad it's not my problem. On to Wednesday's <laughs> mail now, and one for the mimetic fans out there, Leo. Yes, yeah, so uh, apparently infidelity could be contagious. Mm -hmm. um, so research already suggests that up to 75% of men and 68% of women have cheated in some way. I mean, I don't think... It, that sounds catastrophic, but I don't think it's as bad. I think you, you might have cheated on world, one girlfriend in the past yeah. or you might have, you know, uh, looked at women or whatever. Um, but now researchers from Reichman University uh, found that people are more likely to cheat if they know that other people are having affairs. But, that, I mean, that's the same with, with anything. It's a tactic used in sales, so you tell... Yeah people that, you know, other people have bought this product and then they're more likely to buy it. It's a validation of the, the product. Yeah, it's a normalisation, isn't it, of yeah. the behaviour. I read about the, the tactics of the survey as well. Basically, they, they did it with... If you're... They, they like, introduce the idea that lots of people have, uh, are doing this. Yeah. And then at the end, the person who's actually conducted the interview slips in a little sort of cheeky, flirtatious suggestion that they this, might this... like to, you know, have another... That was experiment number three. Yeah. I think <laughs> I the think... first one was, was they showed them Im or images or told them stories of people who've uh, been unfaithful and then uh, asked them about their own fantasies and so on. And the yeah. second one where they encourage them a bit more and the third one... Yeah. It, it's a bit the like... The fourth they, they, one is at a music festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 which encourages everybody. But, of course, there's always these studies that the feel... Uh, ridiculously predictable. There was that one where they, they show men pornography uh, and then don't allow them to relieve themselves and then found that they, uh, they, they have, they have uh, dirtier fantasies and they, right. they would have done earlier on. <laughs> like, wow, really, that's absolutely stunning. Well, that's fascinating. The cat. What they did find is that... Oh, sorry, what they did find is that men with deeper voices are less reliable. Well, more testosterone, isn't yes, it? That's totally. what they say. I think but this it's... was in China, though, as well, which was quite interesting. I wonder if that is a slightly a cultural thing. How racist but... are you about to be? Just well, I just... Think... <laughs> it's quite interesting. Different levels of uh, testosterone, different types of masculinity... They have high voices. voices. Higher voices they in do. China, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> so, fact. any level of testosterone... Not... <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Simon is just burning say, his say the truth. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> but, no, they do say that in, that in that survey, they did say that, whereas there was no... Um, tendency among women for higher pitched or lower pitched that made no difference. But they right. didn't say whether they had more or less testosterone. I don't right. know. Do women have? To, I mean, that would be quite an interesting like thing Doc to Cotton. know, wouldn't it? Yeah, if you have a lot. Doc Cotton is more. Likely to cheat. <laughs> I've you think never Margaret heard Thatcher? Of a man say, "I really fancy her. She's got such a high voice." I know exactly. <laughs> and also, there certainly is a limit. I mean, you don't want a sort of guttural growl. But you know. also, Chris Rock made the made the point about how uh, a, a lot of times with men, infidelity is limited by availability. Yeah, yeah. You know, like so, it's not the man's choice. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Wednesday's Times now. Chinese youth were staying in this on this skid patch. From the <laughs> Chinese youth have responded to a dilemma many married couples in this country face every day, Kerry. Um, Chinese youth are choosing pets and gaming over sex. Um, and there's a lot of pregnant pets. 
It doesn't say that. <laughs> uh, this is a pub uh, report published in the Chinese Journal of Sociology, uh, peer-reviewed, which, I, 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 as far as I know, this is what we're seeing all over the world, generally, is that young people mm. aren't having sex as much as the older generation, and uh, you're really missing out. Do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yes, this particularly tells us in China, and uh, the, the people with the deeper voices are still having a lot of fun, though. I mean, you would say probably <laughs> gaming, that doesn't surprise anyone, does it? The idea of young people, you know, stuck on their, their Xbox instead of getting out and, and taking a risk in, in the bars. But the pets thing is a bit weird, isn't it? What's, what, is, what is that? Are I've they, never understood what? the pets thing. I was, I was up in um, Nottingham recently. I passed one of those pets cafes, right. you know, where people go along just to have loads of cats around them. Well, like half but an no, hour with a pet sort of I thing. was thinking of starting an orphan cafe where you can go <laughs> along and there's a load of orphans, you can feed them, pat them on the head and stuff. <laughs> feel good about yourself. The bad yeah. you can't get a bit. But the, the pet shouldn't require such constant attention that you... That, you know what I mean? Like, you can see how people get addicted to gaming, but I don't understand... Yeah, what, but I think, I think the pet provides the sort of emotional, uh, emotional support and right, I think okay. the companionship to... that a uh, partner... You're might. trying to justify this nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is, you know... Go, I don't think it's just Choose people. I don't think it's just that you know gaming is easy and available, so you can do it. You know, and going out to, and trying to chat up a woman is, is scary. I, th mm. I think it's the fact that you know a, a lot of the times you know now you know so much. If you go up and, and chat up a woman, that can be seen as harassment. You could be uh, yep. you know arrested. Uh, there's the, the stakes are a lot higher than you know. But it's also, I, don't, I know this might sound a bit racist, but there's one and a half billion Chinese. They can afford to stop having as much sex for a while. No, they can't. They're yeah. in deep demographic trouble. But we haven't got time to explore that now. <laughs> this next one from Wednesday's Express is bound to stimulate a mass debate. <laughs> well done. I can see where he's going with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men in the UK. A new research has found a novel way to reduce your risk regularly ejaculating. So right. researchers discovered that men who ejaculated 21 times a, oh, a month, thought it was going to be a day, <laughs> were 33% less likely to develop prostate cancer. So, yeah, get ejaculating. I mean, it's great. You can do it anywhere, on the bus. <laughs> Here he's ejaculating right now. If you've got a purpose, you can. Yes. You've got a prescription. So you've got a good reason. For it. Yeah. yeah. I've known that for at least 10 years. I used to do a routine about it. <laughs> I had a stand-up routine about, oh, great, that's just another bloody job I've got to do because I'm not going to get any help with that, etc., yes. etc. <laughs> And, and but, but I'd read it in the back of a uh, men's health magazine like, yeah. at least 10 years ago. They come up with this stuff all the time, don't they? I yeah, think they just keep re re realising yeah, it, yeah. don't they? I'm sure yeah. we've heard this so many times. Yeah. That, uh, but it's nice that there is one disease that's got a cure that, that doesn't involve more exercise or eating yes. or going on a diet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're fair, five fair, fair, fair to them. Fair play. <laughs> Technically, it's a kind of exercise. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there is an upper limit. I suppose there must be an upper limit to how... how be oh, yeah. Before it starts bringing on extra benefits. I think, I but... think if you start uh, coming blood, <laughs> then it's time to... Just hot air. Yeah, sort yeah, of low yeah, gasping yeah. Rin rasp. On to Wednesday's <laughs> Guardian and a topic that engenders balanced and calm views throughout the land. Kerry, what's yours? Spat at, abused and run off the road. Why do some cyclists... Oh, sorry, some people hate cyclists so much. Uh, so this is coming from The Guardian, and uh, it largely no. it's an odd story from The Guardian, because it largely starts with a very long piece of someone complaining. Um, I'm going to read what she says here. It's an 18-year-old saying, uh, you wouldn't catch me... Uh, old complaining about someone saying you wouldn't catch me on a bike. People would say, if they spotted my helmet or the cycling shorts peeking out beneath my dress. To be fair, it was quite hairy at times. Which, now that's rather unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah. That's the exact <laughs> quote. She says, people uh, peeking out of... Uh, or peeking out of her dress, it was quite hairy at times. But I think she's using the other use of the word hairy. Yeah. Is it life but she could have thought yeah. about that just yeah. a little bit guarding, more. So I'm pretty sure yeah. she was also quite hairy. <laughs> <laughs> But what's she saying? I mean, is there an actual news story? Someone said, if I had my way, I'd have them all shot. I, I, I think this started off as a story in the Daily Mail and then it went right. to... It became uh, part of a radio and then a programme, a phone-in... Is it Jeremy now Vine caused, stoking um, up all this anger again? He's usually, like, at the forefront of any story to do with cyclists with his, with his mobile helmet cam. Uh, yes, it was. I haven't actually... I can't say it was, but... I, well, I am saying it was. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even found we'll a label we'll, on here. We'll have that I'm guess. looking through the news very fast here. There, there's suggestions that, that cyclists... Uh, should have number plates, but of course, there's no, there's no real ideal here because a number plate is bigger than a cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. going to make uh, it's very hard to get the cycle into one of those little cycle. Uh, you know, Imagine those, how angry they'd be if you, as a cyclist, wore a number plate across your back, and that was what gouged a great scratch into the car paintwork, which was squeezed <laughs> through a narrow gap. <laughs> very typical. Surrey police accused of using phantom traffic units on Waze app. Yeah, so I don't know if you use the Waze app, but I it's, have it's done, fantastic. Yeah. It, so yeah. it shows you. It's, it's oh. like a, a sat nav, but it shows you 
where all it's updated by its users to show you where all the speed cameras are. Yeah. Uh, which is which is great. Uh, it's, I'm not being paid by them. It just genuinely is great. So you can slow. Down, I mean, you can make sure you continue mm, going yes. at the correct speed yes. uh, when there's a speed camera. But uh, Surrey Police have been. Uh, people have said uh, suggested they're falsely reporting lo their locations. Uh, as stationary speed traps uh, on on the ways app when they're actually just driving along the road, so they're just yeah. dropping one every few few miles to get people to slow down. And the <laughs> the, the police, sorry, police replied saying, "We definitely don't drop police markers on ways at random points on our on our patrol. Nope, never." Followed by a winking emoji. Who would have thought a sarky cop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you? But I think I think it's great. I mean, it's uh, you know people will drive at the right speed limit. You know, they're not. Yeah. Yeah, breaking any, they're, they're gaming the system, which is what we're doing when we use the Waze app. Absolutely, that seems. But fair it will enough. come back on them, wouldn't it? If the police lie, then eventually you don't trust that anything they're going to put out. They, they, they need to be reliable. It's but their the, job. Then you'll to, get a speeding ticket. Then you, you get a speeding ticket, and one. then they can afford to uh, in, engage some more IT professionals <laughs> for the next round. Well, apparently <laughs> they added so cool. nowhere on Waze does it say the patrol has to be stationary. And you think, oh, that's, you're going to be a bit sarky, it's sarcastic now. That's it. Like it, it does. That is what you're suggesting. Mm. There is a stationary cop there. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, right. there was a stationary camera. I don't think cameras are allowed to track you or, or it would come, come towards you at high speed yeah. the other way. That would certainly yet. throw... Into, would you think that will happen? <laughs> I'm sure that's going to happen. Drones yeah. flying overhead. Don't give them ideas. Drop fires <laughs> in through your window. Wednesday's Telegraph. And does this next one mean Brits are essentially immortal then, Kerry? Uh, drinking tea could help you live longer. Um, many cups uh, you need... Sorry, I'll tell you how many cups you need. Drinking just two cups of tea per day could lower your risk of mortality by 10%. And if you do it while masturbating, then you do yourself yeah, a whole yeah. load of favours. Wow. Kill two birds with one stone. Mm. Um, so this is from the annals of... Uh, annals, annals, <laughs> the annals of... Uh, internal medicine. Um, it doesn't matter though whether it's tea or whether it's coffee, uh, you can have milk or sugar, um, any preferred tea temperature. Um, I Is imagine it caffeine, you can also have juice, water, or you know, generally, if you drink, you'll live. Yeah. If you don't, Is it's there bad. any ingredient that does matter? Well, um, there's tannins and stuff, there's antioxidants tannins. in tea. But okay. I, think, I think really this is just a case, I don't know if it's causality here or just the fact that tea is a marker for being, you know, maybe slightly posher. Uh, and if you're posher, you're more likely to look after yourself and have, you know... Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, you work in offices. People in offices drink a lot of tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They last they longer, tea. they're not in dangerous people jobs. People have a mug of tea, don't they? Builders like tea. Builders like coffee. They're like a latte. Yeah, they're coffee people, yeah. as they should be. Yeah. I'm totally with you on this. I'm sensing an enormous rabbit hole here and I'm not going down <laughs> it. The Times once more, it seems dolphins have developed more advanced skills than the inhabitants of Stevenage. Gary, I don't know why he's picked on Stevenage there. Where are we, dolphins? This is about um, dolphins having the ability to uh, organise in gangs or something. Now, I found this a really odd story because uh, what it's saying is um, this is a study of male dolphins published in the Proceedings of the National Ac Academy of Sciences, which demonstrates that animals have the ability to make strategic cross group alliances to boost their reproductive success. Right. I hope you understood that. Are they, yeah. um, so they, they've thought species... They, 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 they haven't thought this of species. They haven't seen evidence of this from species before. So this is not just... It's I mean, obviously, dolphins, chimpanzees, lots of things organised socially, but then they have other outgroups that there's always conflict between them. That's right. This, it's defined... The, the, the outgroups are defined by conflict. But we, we see trends... Like, um, there was news today of orcas wearing dead fish on their heads. Right. This is a true story. <laughs> was that um, at Met Gala? Yes. Yeah. Like, this is just <laughs> John Paul Gautier's news. More like <laughs> Bjorkers. <laughs> ah, come on. Very nice. Bjorkers. <laughs> Probably better end right now. i on that um, one. There's, <laughs> there's evidence that traits and social contagions happen amongst animals. But, right. And uh, but at the same time, <laughs> you get an orca wearing a dead fish, you think, wow, yeah. we've really learnt something. We see a human doing it. <laughs> 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 and we're not impressed, impressed at all. Yeah. No, but then Carmen Miranda was it used to wear a sort of fruit salad on her head, didn't she? I suppose oh, that's it. The Carmen Miranda, oh, the Brazilian singer, you know. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I guess it's a similar thing, right? That's not the a same thing, of, but know, fairly close. Yeah. Dead fish to an orca is like a is like a delicacy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get low blood sugar while you're, you know, yes. singing on stage in Brazil, or you, you get low blood sugar when you're swimming around. So yeah, it's, it's not the only example they give, though. Is is such as protecting females from other rivals. That's, that's actually the only in all the whole. So they probably have more successful so. music festivals than we yeah, do. Totally, yeah. yeah. We finish, gentlemen, with Wednesday's Independent and a painting within a painting. Yeah, so they found this uh, Van Gogh or Van Gogh, however you pronounce it, uh, painting. Oh. 
that was painted over the x ray <laughs> It's a portrait of two male wrestlers, uh, Hulk Hogan and uh, Ric Flair. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, uh, ten years ago they found it under a still life painting by Van Gogh and uh, they've, they've now recreated it using probably, like, Photoshop. So he painted like over his own painting, Eddie? Yeah, and the picture yeah. he wanted no one to see has <laughs> finally surfaced. Generally, yeah. when I picture naked wrestlers, I paint over it really yeah. fast as well. You know. <laughs> 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 hope, hope no one's going to uncover it in a few years. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. It doesn't look to me like a, a lost classic. Even you know, I'm not a huge fan. Oh, fan. Yeah, but Van Gogh. Also, they used the X-rays to to find it, which is quite clever. Yeah. Do they not call it the palimpsest, or is that is that only with manuscripts? I remember I that know. word was very popular so, yes. well, when you when you use old paper to write new notes. Mm. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much, Leo and Kerry. It's been a joy to come back. I'll be back again tomorrow night. My guest will be the big dog himself, Nick Dixon, and Jonathan Hogan. <laughs> See you then. Good night. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me from 9pm to midnight every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, 